This week, Joe Gray, the owner and producer of the Advanced Persistent Security Podcast, joins us for an interview. None other than Ed Scotus will come on and talk about the SANS Holiday Hack Challenge. And rather than the news this week, because we've covered a lot of news this year, we're going to talk about six topics that we're going to be producing in an on-demand webcast series. And we're going to kind of bat around those topics, see if they're the right topics, and... Um, Kind of give some people, uh, a listener, our listeners rather, a preview into some of the topics we'll be discussing next year. All that and more on this edition of Paul Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Azadorian. Excited to be here, as always, on Paul's Security Weekly. Yeah. Hi, and welcome to the show. I totally introduce our host right now, but I've got a totally awkward boner. But we're. <laughs> oh, hey! I'm, I'm in the studio with you guys. That's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> sounds like a plan. And we'll at least have one person listening. That's right. <laughs> Just yeah, yeah I, I know. And I appreciate it. And I, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed your spooning with Jeff. But, uh, you know. Hey, that's actually built a new office. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, third baby on the way, so I needed a new office. Nice. I, I, I lost my old office. That's now the baby room. Brought to you by... Has your network been breached? Cyber Reason can help you answer this question. Cyber Reason products hunt for threats within your network and eliminate them in real time. To Cyber Reason, real time means within seconds. Founded by former military hackers who don't play by the rules, they've built this experience into their platform. Harness ingenuity and imagination, not just code, to defeat attackers. Cyber Reason, disrupt the adversary and let the hunt begin. Endgame automates the hunt for both known and never before seen adversaries in enterprise networks. Built on unique knowledge on the adversary's tools, techniques, and tactics, Endgame's centrally managed agent prevents, detects, and responds to advanced adversaries in the earliest stages of the kill chain without prior knowledge. Endgame, automate the hunt. The average time between being hacked and realizing you've been hacked is one year. Can you afford to let an intruder roam your network for that long? Can your company weather the fallout when this comes to light? Black Hills Information Security can find the bad guys in your network and train you to do it yourself. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a hunt teaming engagement can help you find a persistent threat in your network. And welcome to the show. Now, let me introduce you to a man whose sweater says something very interesting says, sit on my lap. But you know what? I think I'd rather sit on Jack's. Paul Asadorian. Welcome, everyone, to <laughs> Paul Security Weekly. This is episode 540. I almost said 560. It's 540. 40. Yep. 560 is the Sands of class. Course. I always get those numbers confused. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. This is our... Well, I think we're doing another episode next week, but we've dumped we this one, our, our Christmas edition, because we had our, our holiday we're Christmas party, party today uh, here at, at Security Weekly. So meaning everyone is well lubricated going into the <laughs> Everyone <show. clears throat> has been lubricating since about noon today. So just a warning, <laughs> putting a, a warning label on the show. Some of the older folks might be napping. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what's awesome about this is that here in studio, we have some of our regular hosts on the show, um, and Mr. Jeff Mann is directly to my left. Jeff, welcome. Nice to have you in studio. It's great to be here, Paul. Try to stay awake for the whole episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've been commiserating for a while. Larry Pesce is, of course, here. Yes. Adorning his uh, holiday sweater. Is that Sasquatch? Sasquatch. The legend yeah. is real. Yes. In it's a, a, a fantastic uh, a gift from my good friend, Mike Poor. It's very, very it's nice. Right. Well done, Mike. Well done. Uh, Jack put together his own ensemble of, he's here in studio. And are you Father Creepy Christmas? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you creep over here and... No, I'm good. Creep over here and sit on my lap? I'm good. <laughs> talk totally about, good talk sitting about over here. the first thing that pops up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we have some uh, celebrations. And I, I, you know, I in my travels in the, in the industry, I, I worked for someone and... Uh, one of the things that uh, his son said to him one day that kind of stuck with him was his son said, have fun at work, Dad. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of our listeners, viewers, uh, hosts, employees, sponsors, 
for really like allowing me to have fun at work and I hope all of us have fun at work because you, you work a really good chunk of your life so you should really have fun at it mm -hmm. uh, and this has been a fantastic year uh, it marks almost two years since I've left Tenable and, and done this full time and I'm having fun at work so I mean that's really that's important um, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, 2018 we got a lot of great things planned and we had a great holiday party so we're gonna we're gonna celebrate I, I think the holidays and having fun at work with these awesome champagne bottles and uh, that pop confetti, I think really because it looks really cool on camera. So let's wait till we get the right. Uh, we're gonna put all four of us on frame. There we go. And then we're gonna. Are do, we supposed wait, to take this wait. off first? Like I'm supposed to pierce the top. <coughs> pierce the top. Pierce. The, did you? Sorry, pierce, I have. I have some just piercing comments. Here, yeah. stick your finger in it. There you go. Oh, and Joff is. I'm sorry, I forgot. To, Joff oh, is here with oh. us. Mm. Wait, Joff. He's we, right here. It's, it's, on the lines via Skype. Joff Fire is here with okay. us, helping us celebrate for this episode. <laughs> That was going to be my first comment was, are you going to introduce your co-hosts? And the second comment was, is this called your Champagne Daily? Yes, this is the Champagne Daily. That's an inside joke. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up on the show, Joff. It's nice to have you. Um, and I'm looking forward to this episode. Lots of fun things to talk about. But first... There's an arrow that tells us which... We're going to celebrate. To we're going to twist. Yeah. We're going to... Happy holidays and have fun at work. One, two, three, go! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Jack, you get it. Yay! Yay! Jack, Jack yeah! Woo! Yeah, that was, that hey, was uh, awesome. Took me a while lady. to get that to fire. <laughs> yeah. I noticed that, Jack. It's quicker you than you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, we yeah. just talked about the first thing. It'll pop up. Yeah. <laughs> I got some it, of my, a lot in my drink, a actually. Not. <laughs> Wow. Uh, Joff, I'm sorry for not. It's, so, how are you doing, Joff? <laughs> like, we could uh, Joff I'm, some I'm, love. I'm doing okay. I had... Uh, the most horrendous experience getting back to the U.S. from Europe. Uh, but uh, outside of that, um, uh, let's just say that uh, London Heathrow does not know hand how to handle snow. I'm a little surprised, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, in much like episode 500, Joff, um, we had our holiday party today, and of course there was snow this morning. Yep. Oh, that's so. fantastic. Uh, you, you know, I'm really disappointed I couldn't be there, but... I gotta tell you, it's not been a good start of my week. So it's let's it's freak out Rhode point. Island and plan the next party for like July. Let's, it let's see it, if it, it snows. It'll snow. It'll snow. Yeah. It'll for snow. Sure. But either, either and, way, and, and, and by the way, um, uh, by the way, Jeff, that's a that's a lovely T-shirt that you have on there. You like that? I do. Who are the characters on right there? Who are the characters on this on this shirt for our, our audience? Well, the the characters are uh, three uh, Black Hills employees. Uh, one, namely me, um, which would be um, should really to, have a close uh, up. That's on I'm that's on Jeff's right man boob. Yeah, and, uh, dashingly the, handsome one, right? Got it. Yeah, and and the and the guy in the middle is our epic red beard Bo Bullock, who does uh, Hack Naked TV, uh, and an excellent job he does indeed. And then uh, the lady, the lovely lady on Jeff's left man boob. Would be Sally, who is one awesome pen tester for Black Hills. So, great collection of people. If you come to Wild West Hacking Fest, you too you could too see can... all sorts of antics and T-shirts like this. And uh, Bo actually hosts uh, Tradecraft Security Weekly, which we are on schedule to do in 2018. It's a fantastic weekly technical segment uh, that Bo does every week. So make sure you check that out. Uh, I know, I know, content. Bo. Yes. Do you know? Oh, and 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 by the way, um, just to uh, throw in an extra little bit of tidbit on those T-shirts, I gave those T-shirts hack for Nugan to all of my European students, most of which were German, some France, uh, French, sorry, and uh, some uh, Dutch folks. They loved that T-shirt, so bit very popular. <laughs> Fantastic! Uh, make sure you check out our fine friends at itpro.tv. Uh, we're very happy to work with them. And, you know, I, I think for me, and we'll talk about this in, in later segments too, there are a lot of ways which you need to work towards uh, educating and training yourself in information security. Um, IT Pro fills that niche by giving you kind of like on-demand access to a whole bunch of training resources and it, it's interesting. I was actually talking uh, with someone who's a listener of the show, and they're like, you know, I, I hadn't heard of IT Pro TV. I heard about it on the show, and I subscribed to a subscription. I loved the content. So, like, he heard us talk about it. He was like, okay, since you guys are talking about it, I'll check it out. Checked it out and was like, holy crap, that's awesome. 
brought it back to his organization and said, hey, this would be great to like have a, an entire team or multiple teams here in our organization subscribe to this training and are going to IT Pro for the supervisor portal. So it's not just our like, uh, you know, kind of seal of approval. Uh, I'm speaking with people who have had awesome experiences with IT Pro TV. So uh, I'm just, I'm super happy that our sponsors can solve problems for our listeners. That's, that's the goal. Uh, and that was kind of a, a story and I wanted to share. And training is really important. Like that, that's almost like a topic that we should, we should talk, talk about, about sometime. Yeah. Which yeah. We'll, we'll get, to, we'll, we'll, we'll get, get there. The, we'll get you know, it's, it's, uh, and Don, Don <laughs> Bizet is, is just such a fabulous, uh, individual. We, we had a good time at Wild West Hacking Fest. Don, Don did an interview of me at Wild West Hacking Fest and a couple other people that were really, really cool. So great folks there at, uh, at IT Pro TV. I want to introduce our guest, uh, first guest for today, Joe Gray, who is the host of the Advanced Persistent Security Podcast. Joe, welcome to the program. Uh -oh. Thanks for having me. It helps if I have uh, the volume on on my mixer whenever I speak. <laughs> no worries. No worries. <laughs> Not hey, like we've ever made that mistake. We're professionals. Yeah, 13 years in, dude, believe me, we've, we, we always have our share of, uh, of issues. So Every damn show. <laughs> Every damn time. So, uh, Joe, <laughs> tell us. Confetti falling it's out of the it's ceiling. Like it's raining the... confetti. Uh, so, yeah, Joe, yeah, tell yeah, us yeah, how you yeah, got, yeah, uh, yeah. to kind of uh, set the stage here, tell us how you got your start in information security. Uh, I navigated submarines in the Navy for seven years, and um, I had some clearance. And as I was getting out, there was really no submarines in the civilian world to navigate. <laughs> so uh, someone that was uh, a good friend of mine uh, said that a good friend of his was hiring uh, to be a government contractor if I had a certain level of clearance. He put us in contact with each other, and uh, the rest is history. Um, so within that role, basically, I was assembling um, – formal documents for certification and accreditation for um, an agency within the intelligence community. Nice. Very nice. Joe, so um, have you you've made the transition from uh, working for uh, the military into working for the public sector? I don't want to, if you don't want to, you know, talk about what your day job is today, that's okay. But uh, have you have kind of like made that for transition? How much clearance do you need to work in a submarine? Uh, it depends on the job. So it's at like a minimum a secret. Foot, two feet. Uh, yeah, six feet. Five six feet. feet six feet. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh. I, 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 um, I knew that was a joke, joke. coming at him. Yeah. Sorry. Nice. There, there's a few vessels you could probably ask that question, and the answers may vary. Mm -hmm. oh, 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 oh. So, Joe, how, how has your career progressed? Like you went from a military to uh, it sounds like a government contractor, and then if you transition in the public sector? Uh, yes. So I went from being a government contractor to a GS employee. And then from there, I went back to being a contractor. And uh, now I'm actually a consultant um, for uh, any and everybody that will hire us. So, Joe, what was that transition like? And we've, we've had some of these interviews on some of our other programs as well. Uh, and it's kind of been a theme that our listeners are really latching on to. Um, how was that transition from working, uh, you know, in the military to then contractor to then now kind of independent consultant? Um, like what skills did you bring along with you? What were some of the challenges in making that transition from uh, military and government work to uh, more public sector? So the number one uh, issue I ran into getting out of the military and going into the uh, non-military workforce was uh, cleaning up my potty mouth. Um, you can imagine how you can imagine how vulgar people on a submarine uh, could speak. Uh, I've gotten to the point now to where I I can kind of turn it on and off if I need to. Um, but with that being said, uh, a lot of the things I brought with me. Um, so, like when I was doing navigation, we would be assigned a certain amount of water space. We could go in anywhere we wanted within this area from this depth to this depth, and. One of the captains of the submarine I was on, he had a policy that if you went to anyone with a problem, you had to recommend a solution. So it could be something as simple as, uh, officer of the deck, sir, uh, the sanitary tank is at 90 percent. Uh, recommend uh, coming to such and such feet and pumping sanitary tank number one overboard or blowing sand one overboard, which is basically where you just inject high pressure, well, pressurized air into the tank and blow the poop overboard. Hmm. Um, so 
That's something that I tend to carry with me now. So whenever I identify a problem, I always try to have some sort of recommended solution to go alongside it. Um, aside from that, the transition, like from being a contractor to a government employee, that one, that was a strange transition because in some agencies, uh, if you're a contractor, you're considered scum of the earth, uh, whereas at others, you're just a normal person. Um, making the transition from an agency where contractors were scum of the earth to um, an agency where I was a government employee, but contractors were even less than scum of the earth uh, was very challenging because I kind of resonated with the contractors. You know, they kind of felt like my people, so to speak. Um, so working through the red tape was really the hardest part for me there. Um, I, will, I didn't stay in that job uh, very long just because of the red tape um, and the fact that I was, I was about 25 and I was a GS-12 and I had a hard time fitting in with the other uh, GSs. They wouldn't let me play the GS games. Um, and they made me have a bright, shiny nose. Uh, but realistically, so, uh, Joe, I, I, for, for those of us listening that don't know what a, a GS is, could you d describe that and describe that dynamic? Sure. So within the government, uh, they have pay grades that to some degree act as equivalency to military ranks. Um, in a time of war, it could actually be something. But for the most part, it is... Uh, just a pay grade. It ranges from GS-1 to GS-15, which government service, uh, I believe is what the GS stands for. Yep. There are 10 steps to each GS, and basically uh, after you meet your time in service, you get bumped up to the next grade, and, and that basically just dictates uh, where you are in the world. So if you're a manager, you might be a GS-13 in some organizations or a 14 in others, uh, whereas some GS-7s are managerial in other organizations. And then uh, GS-1 to GS-15 basically covers E-1, so a private, all the way up to a four-star admiral or a general. Uh, and then they have a thing called the Senior Executive Service, which basically is the equivalent of flag officers, such as admirals and generals. And so, Joe, now, <clears throat> what do you do today? What type of consulting do you uh, do today? So I'm an enterprise security consultant at uh, Sword and Shield Enterprise Security in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, as a byproduct of... Uh, being an enterprise consultant, basically a lot of times I do blue team type stuff. So um, in my current role, I do a lot of NIST 800-171 uh, controlled unclassified information assessments, uh, gap analysis, incident response. Uh, sometimes I'll do like firewall configurations. And then um, because of my uh, experience in social engineering, I do a lot of uh, pretexting and phishing engagements as well. So in your assessment of, uh, of working with enterprises today, largely from a blue team perspective, what are some of the challenges and common themes in the challenges that you see as you go from organization to organization? Uh, lack of standardization, lack of policy. Um, SIMs are kind of an afterthought. Uh, a lot of people are looking to check the box. Um, and then especially with like the NIST 800-171, which deals with uh, government contractors, subcontractors, and the such, uh, they're basically doing the bare minimum to check the box. Yeah, it's interesting. We have that debate about compliance versus security all the time. Well, uh, Jeff, I feel like you want to t chime I've, in here. I, well, <laughs> you know, this is uh, somewhat ancient history for me, but then I just started a job as mm. a government contractor yeah, in okay. the last month, so it's all coming back to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. The uh, like mud. <laughs> government compliance, uh, as Joe is describing, mm -hmm. is not the same as in the commercial world. That stuff that I did for many years. Mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of paperwork. A lot of. I, I think, and I'm sure there's exceptions, but a lot of times, I, I think the exercise is: can you just inundate the assessor, the auditor, with you know enough paperwork that they just kind of say uncle and give up mm -hmm. but and that's one of my problems with historically the couple times where i've had to do government 800 NIST 800 type stuff um uh, compliance work it's like okay when are we going to get around to actually seeing if you're doing anything because mm -hmm. all it is is just paper after paper after paper after paper <clears throat> Joe, for, for those it, listeners that, that haven't heard of the NIST 800 standards, could you kind of give a, a summary of, of what those are and, and uh, try and focus on some of the benefits of it? You know, Jeff's talking about, like, you know, sometimes you get inundated with the paperwork and you're not actually uh, solving any problems. But, you know, talk about those, those standards. Some of them are actually really good. 
Sure. So um, you have NIST 853, which is the document that uh, outlines all the security controls on the various um, control areas, such as physical and environmental access control, personnel security, uh, uh, system in integrity, uh, communications protection, uh, maintenance, and various things. And basically, it's just a set of controls. It's now based on ISO 27000 uh, that takes into account all things that you should probably look at. And it's really, honestly, 853 is a great document in terms of the number of controls uh, and what they have in terms of the content of the controls. The problem lies in the implementation and the compliance. But uh, a document that I also mentioned was 800-171, which is for controlled unclassified information, which was basically for official use only. And it's a subset. Um, they're not using the same control naming conventions, but it's a smaller subset of 853 for non-government organizations. Uh, the beautiful things about uh, the NIST series, uh, basically it's free, anyone can use it. So uh, if you need some sort of compliance, say to get a risk assessment as part of your PCI uh, requirements, you can use NIST in addition to something like say COBIT. So if you don't wanna use COBIT, you could use NIST. Um, there's another framework that goes alongside uh, 853, uh, that whole series, which is affectionately known as the risk management framework. There's another one for critical infrastructure, uh, known as the cybersecurity framework or the CSF, which is another subset of those same controls out of 853, but they're organized differently and you're not dealing with system categorization, um, your impact level, and then of adding overlays, which are some of the further complications that you could deal with uh, with the normal NIST risk management framework. Uh, Joe, you mentioned that some people just want to check a box. <clears throat> Can you give examples where people are like, oh, we want to be compliant to this NIST standard, but basically kind of like bend the rules and say, yeah, we're compliant, we can check this box, but they're not really secure. Sure, so they, they, they pay us, we come in, or you know anyone, they come in, they get assessed, uh, the assessor goes through the entire set of controls, uh, they produce the roadmap, which basically is just another name for a plan of action of milestones or POEM, and then based on getting that document, uh, they are technically compliant for the year 2017. Uh, whether they have multi-factor authentication, uh, regardless of what kind of vulnerability management posture they're in, they're technically compliant because they've documented all of their weaknesses and they stop right there. They have no intent of doing anything further. Yeah, obviously there's a, an issue where if you pick a point in time and say that either we're compliant or we're secure, the, the next day is obviously a totally different you know, but, in today's technology. But Joe's touching on what I, what I was getting at. And, you know, the more I see the government type stuff and I'm getting in and, you know, reintroduced mm. to it, the more I still like PCI. Um, because what he was saying was basically the way you prove you're doing things is you produce a bunch of documents. Whereas with PCI, there's a portion of it is where you have to see that they've got everything documented. But then you say, okay, that's great. Now let's go see... That the, you're actually doing the it. results of yeah. yeah Let's like go look a at hands-on assessment. It's yeah. hands-on. It's shoulder surfing. Mm -hmm. It's okay. You say that you're doing this. Now show me how you're doing it. Mm. And that and the, you know and it's kind of hard to hide that. It's kind of hard to fake that. Right. Not yep. to say that people fake things, but a lot of times it's they produce the document, <clears throat> but then you go out and and maybe you know correct me if I'm if I'm mistaken, Joe, but. Sometimes there's an interview process where you talk to people about the documents and the procedures to try to get a feel <laughs> for whether they're doing it or not. But that's just still not the same as actually sitting down, looking at the systems, looking at the tools and say, show me how you're doing it. Absolutely. There's three levels of assessment, which those are outlined in like NIST 853A and 171A, which is in draft format. And basically uh, you can... You can assess things in one of three ways uh, via review of the document, uh, be it some overarching policy. It could be an interview with, like, say, your HR manager, uh, purchasing team finance, uh, or system administrator. Uh, and then the final way would be through uh, technical observation, such as reviewing your uh, configuration file for Secure Shell, your Apache configuration. Uh, looking at your VPN configuration, taking a look at, say, your GPO baseline or something along those lines. I, I feel like, 
uh, in my experience, a lot of organizations will say or ask the question in such a way that says, well, what's the, the standard? What's the best practice for these particular set of security controls? And they often want to go to something like NIST or some other compliance standard to basically guide them into like what they should be doing to be more secure. It's kind of a double-edged sword, right? Because you can take any standard that you pick, PCI or NIST or whatever, and that may not be exactly what you know will get you to security. But on the flip side of that, it, it kind of does help. Joe, how do you do, you like work that balance between? Yeah, there are good things like it can give you a great starting point, but how do you get people to being more secure based on some of these uh, standards and compliance uh, documents? I'm a big fan of uh, what I call the artist formerly known as the Sans Top 20, the Super <laughs> Internet Security Critical Security Controls. Nice. Um, and as a byproduct, um, basically I'll say something to the effect of, hey, you need these controls, but if you want to look at everything holistically, uh, I recommend looking at the critical security controls because it's looking at the maturity of it. So if you can meet the first five controls, uh, you're more secure. I believe the statistic is then 65% of the world. Uh, if you can meet 19 of those, you're in the top 5%. Uh, I don't remember the exact statistics, but it's something to that degree. And which that one takes a little bit more of a common sense approach in terms of, hey, you need you need to know what's on your network. You need um, as opposed to saying, hey, uh, here's this configuration management control. You need to have a list of all your assets. This one right here says, hey, you need to know what assets are authorized and unauthorized from both a hardware and a software perspective. And you know, there, there are those roadmaps that actually allow you to uh, cross-pollinate and compare the critical security controls to the NIST controls as well as COBIT, HIPAA, insert compliance framework here. <clears throat> I was going to go to Jack. And, uh, Jack, you looked engaged earlier. You were you were pondering something. I could tell. <clears throat> Just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the the frameworks. <clears throat> I think of them in many ways like certifications. That there there are two ways to approach these things. One of them is this is dumb shit I have to do, or hey, uh, let's walk through this and figure out what actually moves us forward and apply compensating controls and document this and learn from the process. And whether it's uh, you getting a certification for yourself personally for your career or these sort of compliance regimes, there, there really seem to be a, a divergent set of people who, organizations who, hey, uh, we have to do this, so do the bare minimum. And yeah, like let's go check a box right. based on a list that someone gives us. Or right? yeah. there are, I don't think enough organizations, I think they're fairly rare, that are like, we have to do this. What can we learn from this process and how can we document improvement and move like, forward? How can we from the, it? be the best organization that it, how can, it takes you know, this it, as a starting we, point? We've got, we got to yeah. do this thing. How can we, how can we, how can we do better? How can yeah. we get value out of it? And um, I, I think it's interesting that uh, consultants often are trapped in the uh, the commoditized version of these things. How do you do it as cheaply as possible versus how do you do it as effectively as possible? So, uh, well, there's another element to that though too, because the the companies that I worked with that wanted to learn and grow and do things were rare, and usually they're the ones that have been popped in an extremely bad way. The, there's a middle <laughs> ground there though that companies that they want to know within their industry, within their space, right. what everybody else is doing <laughs> so they can do just enough so that yeah. when they get popped, they're like, well, we were doing best we were, practice. We were doing yeah, best practices, right? But, but, but there's, I mean, we, 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 any of us that have been in the trenches, uh, as much as we hate it, the I told you so budgeting method works mm. really well. It does. Right? You know, I, you're I alone at two recently. in the morning fixing stuff, but eventually you get to buy a firewall or, you, you know. <laughs> I'm going to back you up. I read an article that uh, stated it very eloquently that said sec uh, companies will implement security under duress. Yeah. And, and that's typically what we've uh, observed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Joe, my question for you is I want to go back to the asset management piece because we all say, the standards say, security practitioners all say, well, we can't secure what we don't know about. So we have to do asset discovery and asset management. But Joe, and, and I know what our answers are. Joe, what's your answer? How many companies are really doing this 
even close to 100% uh, of effectiveness for asset discovery and asset management? I have not seen very many. Hmm. Um, so one of the recommendations that I typically uh, have when working with a client would be to implement uh, a SIM technology so that they can accomplish the, the log correlation, um, vulnerability management to some degree. Uh, if they don't have an IDS, there's that capability to some degree as well. Um, and then you can get an asset list out of your vulnerability scanner if you're doing discovery scans. But that also hinges upon the fact that uh, you have to have the uh, proper configurations there. And um, it's just one of those things that you really, sometimes it's really hard to sell to management that you need to scan these networks that you don't have any hosts assigned to. Or why are you trying to scan the guest Wi-Fi? Why are you trying to, you know, we have our employees connect to the guest Wi-Fi. It's like, but you don't have network segmentation. So what's the point? Why not put them on the rest of the network? Um, and I've not necessarily ran into that, but that's just, you know, one of those hypothetical situations that uh, I wouldn't be surprised if I heard at some point. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the <clears throat> interesting tactics that I've seen this year is to really look at your basics. And I think Joe's right. There needs to be some SIM logging component in there. But looking at the sources that are kind of like, oh, like what hosts are querying our NTP servers, our DNS servers, and our DHCP servers? And like, let's compare that with a, a list of what we know about. And typically that diff is like, oh, yeah, I can kind of clean up my asset discovery by just looking at what's hitting those fundamental network resources in our environment. The sad thing to me, though, is, and I'm, I'm old school, when I think assets, I'm thinking... It's not just school, you're just old. I'm just old. I think data and information, whereas the majority of the industry, when they it's talk true. assets, Goes they're talking that. technology. And, and you know, I, I, I always tried, when I was going out with customers, to try to get them to focus on, you know, what is the data that you, that you're trying to protect? What is what is the the you know the information that's critical to your business? And, and that, uh, so, and, sorry, and, but that's and, really the core. That's a great point. It is the core because there's applications that allow people to access that data, and then there's systems that run those applications and systems that have the the clients that provide them access too. So it's kind of like this whole onion almost right that you have to unravel. Absolutely. But as you said, the data is what what's in I mean, the middle. One of, that's one, one of, of the, your assets. You know. It, I had many PCI customers that were very reluctant, but they were there. Be they were the PCI customer because they'd had incidents, and getting them to focus, which is a PCI requirement, or it's really a prerequisite to know where your credit card data is within your network, and then you know they approached it with, well, if we limit it, limit our systems and lif limit our networks, that can limit our scope. But the process of doing it was they discovered that credit card data was in a thousand different places in their organization. Ninety-five percent of it they didn't know about, and the, just the whole process of discovery helped them to clean up their operations. But you know they didn't. They found out that fifty people in accounting had access to the entire database and was mm. pulling down copies using wildcards and sucking down everything that really didn't need that. Um, so, you know, there was a side benefit of cleaning up their act, but just getting them to understand, oh, yeah, we need to focus on the data rather than it, it, it bothers me that we talk about asset management is what's on your network. It's like, for the love of God, why don't companies know what's on their network? Uh, you know, the reality is they don't. But right. to me, uh, it's always playing catch up and, and it's, it, it, it's sort of a backwards approach to me to figure out what's on your network by running a scanner. It's like, yeah, you should have some clue as to what's on your yeah, network. Which is even you... scarier when you don't know what's on your network that you have to run the scan for. Yeah. Then what's on that technology that you just yeah. found on what your network. What are the applications that run, are on run, those. Or, yeah. or the data running yes. into that whole credit card thing. What, you yeah. know, what file shares and what credit card databases have been downloaded to 12 PCs across the organization. Right. So, so uh, uh, Joe, at, at some juncture, you decided to create your own podcast. What was the, the <laughs> motivating uh, factors behind creating your own podcast? I wanted to be like you, Paul, when I grew up. Oh, well, thank you. That's very flattering. Wow. <laughs> well, flattery will get you um, anywhere. <laughs> so um, I did look to you and Patrick Gray for inspiration when I was spinning it up. And to be honest, I have not published anything since February. I just got so busy uh, between work, uh, blogging, the speaking spree, and 
uh, the SECTF at DerbyCon that I've just really not had the time to publish and get it out there. But um, when I first bought the Advanced Persistent Security.net domain, I was originally trying to have it as a startup and I was trying to run it as a business. I'd never been a consultant a day in my life. I knew nothing about business. So I was listening to a different podcast uh, in the entrepreneurial world, um, Entrepreneur on Fire, now known as EO Fire by John Lee Dumas. And he's like, hey, if you want to get your brand out there, start a podcast. So I started a podcast and I, I did a few episodes by myself and I got some feedback of, hey, people don't want to just sit and listen to you yap about something, especially when you're trying to throw a sales pitch to it. So I started bringing guests on and to date, actually, uh, Jack Daniel was, I believe, my third guest uh, on the show. My first was uh, Georgia. Um, we, we did that at Hacker Halt in 2016 in Atlanta. But um, I kind of evolved away from the whole selling point and more into the I want to have a conversation with someone that has something cool to talk about that someone that's a noob, someone that's seasoned, someone who's, you know, guru expert level can get something out of uh, out of this conversation to some level. Uh, and that's kind of what it evolved into. And then, you know, I just got too busy. Honestly, I've got four episodes recorded that I've just not had the time to edit yet. Well, what are some of your uh, more favorite uh, episodes and people that you've interviewed? I had a lot of fun with uh, Ben Johnson, uh, co-founder of Carbon Black. Uh, he's now at Obsidian. Yep. Uh, Chris Sanders was a great one. Mm -hmm. um, Rob Gresham had a lot of really good stuff. Uh, I always had a good time with uh, InfoSec Sherpa on. Um, the Breaking Down Security guys and myself, uh, we did a joint show with Gary McGraw that was awesome. Nice. Yep. Uh, and then the, the holiday episodes, uh, it was the Defensive Set guys, uh, Myself, uh, BreakSec, uh, the PVC, PVC set guys, they were on. It was always a good time. Uh, I think we're, I think they're talking next week for that. And then RallySec will be joining this year as well. Um, so those were always fun as well. Um, I mean, I have a blast with the podcasting. I mean, uh, of episodes that haven't been published, uh, Cheryl Biswas and Jason Street, those were two awesome episodes. Uh, you know, I, I feel bad that it's not made it out for people to actually hear. It's just I've not had the time. Uh, as you know, some people may know, um, I run into Jeff at several conferences. Uh, I, I spoke quite a bit in 2017, and uh, that took a lot of my time that I would have other, otherwise spent editing. So, Joe, uh, what topics have you been speaking on on the conference circuit this year? Uh, primarily social engineering and open source intelligence. Um I did a couple of uh, talks outside of those arenas uh, dealing with data carving, uh, one dealing with uh, threat intelligence, and then uh, Marcel Lee and I uh, did a um, hack-in-the-box type training exercise where if someone wanted to learn the, the phases of uh, an attack, they could uh, use this virtual machine to work their way through it. Joe, what are, uh, and I always try and keep up with this, uh, but what are some of the more effective methods today uh, in OSN or open source intelligence gathering? It's a, a constant Google. moving target for everyone, right? It's, it's always a moving target. And Google is, so to kind of go back with the social engineering capture the flag, most of the information I found on my target company was via Google. Uh, I used the company's name, I used the company's domain, and then I would add whatever I was looking for, be it phone numbers or whatever, even email addresses, uh, and pump it right through Google. Um, other resources that I'm very fond of, uh, Datasploit works really well uh, for some things. I'm a huge fan of Recon NG. Uh, Michael Basil's website, IntelTechniques.com. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I mean, that's second to none. OSINTFramework.com is another really good resource. Uh, and I've been playing quite a bit with um, Michael Basil's uh, Buscador Linux operating system as well. Oh, so does he have his own uh, platform for OSN? Yes. Uh, he coordinated with uh, Dave Westcott, who helped uh, create Remnux, uh, to create a, a specific Linux distro for OSINT called uh, Buscador. Well, that's awesome. I didn't know that. I'll have to check that out. Uh, Jeff, Larry, Jack, more questions for Joe? None for me. Larry, are those the same similar tools that you use in your OS int gathering? Is that pretty much the yes? Yeah, the standard the standard <laughs> yeah. set. Oh, that's yeah. good. That's good information yeah. for our listeners. Yeah, they, they, I mean, there, there's such a volume of some of those types of things that yeah, there's 
there's just so much out there. Mm-hmm. I'm curious because uh, I used to do OS Int. I used to call it Recon mm-hmm. back in the day. Um, what kind of things do you look for when you do an OSINT uh, exercise? Well, it depends on what the target is and what I'm trying to attain. So, um, for example, I'm doing some research that I plan on submitting to a Las Vegas conference for the summer that deals with information from back pages to try to identify human trafficking. So with that, my targets are purely human. So I'm looking at things like email addresses, phone numbers, trying to find addresses, any any social media, any posts, like for example, with back pages where they're using the same user ID uh, in multiple locations to post multiple things. Uh, that's some of the things I may look for. If I'm going after a business, um, I tend to try to follow the flags that uh, Christopher Hadnagy set up for the SECTF because they're just very well thought out. It's things like, who's your exterminator? Uh, do you outsource uh, your IT? What browser do you use? How do you open PDFs? Do you block websites? Um, can you go to this website? Do you have a VPN? Um, shipments? Uh trash disposal, just various things that could lead to both technical and non-technical, physical and remote uh, things to get in. Like for example, in the SECTF, I spent a lot of time on Facebook and I found that my target had an employee who uh, posted a picture of his badge. And then I pivoted from there and went to link, uh, I'm sorry, Indeed, and I found a different employee that had posted uh, that he had upgraded the badge reader from this model to this model and had upgraded the phone system from Avaya to Cisco VoIP. Mm -hmm. So that's the type of stuff I would look at. And then Mm -hmm. with technologies, like with job descriptions, for example, I found one where there was um, a specific job rec that said they needed to use a specific version of this version of Oracle. So I went to exploit DB and well, lo and behold, there's a SQL injection and a server side request forgery vulnerability for that, for that specific version. Um, And that's the point where I stopped. But uh, obviously, we see where that could carry into as well. Yep. Cool. No, that's that's fantastic. Um, with, with respect to Facebook, did you have to create uh, an account to obtain that information, or was that on that person's public Facebook page? It was on that person's public because one of the things that I attempt to do whenever I'm stalking, for lack of a better term, via social media, um, I don't befriend people. I don't befriend people that I'm – evaluating. Mm. I've got my regular account that I use for everything. You know, I don't post anything to my actual page. I usually keep everything confined to groups. Uh, But then I have a ghost account that I use um, for things like connecting to the API uh, and then just doing searches on potential targets and things like that. Um, The same goes with Twitter. um, Same goes with Instagram, which I don't really get a whole lot out of Instagram, but I've got it just in case. Um, I would say Facebook. Uh, that tends to be the one that has the most information. Although during the SECTF, I found a vice president that was complaining because he had missed a meeting in Amsterdam because he was delayed on a United Airlines flight in Newark. So uh, a sample pretext that I could have used would have been to call him purporting to be from United Airlines to try to uh, increase his satisfaction and give him some miles or something to uh, make him feel better. It's interesting. And Facebook provides facilities to control what information is shared publicly and I feel like no one does that. Is that your experience as well? I see a distinct rift. Uh, they either share everything or nothing at all. Yeah. And you only and, need that one or two employees that share everything to really get enough pretext to, to conduct social engineering. Oh, absolutely. Um, just through my analysis uh, of my target, I found out that everybody that worked at this company liked craft beer. So when I was on the phone uh, with uh, – my first target, because I only had two people answer the phone during the phone call portion of the SECTF. Uh, I just said, hey, it, it was a Friday, and I said something to the effect of, happy Friday. I can't wait to get out of here. I, I want to go drink some craft beer. Uh, I get off at 4.30. What time do you get off? And you know, it just, it just went from there because I knew that a lot of the people that worked there liked craft beer. And seeing as the company was in Louisville, if, if that person hadn't have liked craft beer, I would have probably assumed that they liked bourbon. Right, right. Oh, that's awesome. More questions for Joe? We just have five questions for you, Joe. Are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? I've been thinking of these five questions for uh, a long time. There you go. <laughs> Here's oh your chance to shine. Someone that's prepared. All right. Joe, three words I'm to describe. 
<clears throat> yourself? Um, quirky, driven, oddball. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Kindness. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Failing Upward. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Second and then first on the second round. <laughs> Choose wow. two celebrities to be your parents. This was the hard one. Um, it is the most I was difficult say, one. I was originally going to say Jeff Mann and Jack Daniel, but I'm going with uh, Alan Turing <laughs> and Mariska Hargitay. There you go. <laughs> and so <Joe>, where, <laughs> where can people find you uh, on social media and find your, your podcast? Uh, podcast is uh, on iTunes and all the other fine podcasting platforms. It's called Advanced Persistent Security. The website is advancedpersistentsecurity.net. Um, I'm on Twitter at C underscore 3 P Joe. Uh, one of the uh, things I'm working on right now that's kind of interesting is actually a thing called Through the Hacking Glass on Peerlist, uh, which is a mentorship program that we're working on getting off the ground. So you can also find me uh, on Peerlist as well if you're interested in being a mentor or being mentored. Um, this will actually be technical mentorship to help people get experience that will actually help them uh, within the workforce. That, uh, but aside fantastic. from that, um, so aside from that, uh, I've got a Facebook page. Uh, it's Joe Gray InfoSec. It's a page, not a profile. So um, you don't have to friend request me or anything. And um, aside from that, yeah, I'm pretty much in all those places. I'm on LinkedIn as well, but um, you know, that's, it should be fairly easy to find there. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. And that's also, and so your mentorship thing that that's on peer list. How do, how do we find that? Uh, that's at peer list P E E R L Y S T.com. Uh, right now we've got one post up announcing that it's coming. Uh, again, it's called through the hacking glass. Mm -hmm. Uh, also with the abbreviation of T T H G. Um, and basically it's just the product of, uh, Brian Austin and I were talking about ideas one day and we identified that a lot of people like I'm very active in mentorship in that first job out of the Navy. I had two people that took a very active uh, interest in ensuring my success and making sure that I wasn't an absolute moron and that I learned the things I needed to learn. And I've tried to pay that forward as I progress through my career. Uh, and right now I have. I believe five mentees uh, that I'm pushing through to learn various things from OSINT, social engineering, uh, incident response, basic Linux, even uh, just to work, uh, work their way up. Um, and then, you know, we, we always hear these stories of, oh, here's an entry level job that requires a CISSP, which technically requires five years experience. So what we're doing is we're setting up five levels of a range so that people can come in, they can harden a system. And then in the next phase, Someone will, will be monitoring and someone will be pen testing at the same time based on what the first person hardened. And then the next phase, someone will come in and do incident response as a byproduct of the information they were provided by the person doing the monitoring as well as what the pen tester actually did. And at the end, we'll all sit down, debrief it and uh, share notes uh, for the purpose of uh, everybody learning. That's awesome. Uh, I'm a big fan of the mentorship program, so I'm glad to hear there's a, that you're doing that. Joe, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. Thank you for having me. And with that, we're going to take a short break. Come back with Ed Scotus. Stay tuned. <laughs> 